years, Paul Reed Smith has made the finest handmade electric guitar in the country. Now, the biggest names in the business play his instruments, and with the resulting increase in demand, he's just about to open a factory in Annapolis. Paul, before we get into your incredible instruments and future plans, I'm sure our viewers would like to know just how and why you chose building a better guitar as your dream. Playing guitar is something I always wanted to do, you know, from the time you get the little piece of junk, you know, when you're uh, in junior high school. Yeah, we all had one yeah. of those. Um, and uh, I, you know, after I started playing guitar, it just started to become very obvious to me that I wanted to build them. I wanted really nice guitars, but I didn't have the money so the only way I could get the gear was to make it so I would make guitars um, and so I, you know it was it was I wanted you know I wanted really good instruments but it didn't have the money so I, you know if I didn't have a speaker cabinet I'd make it if I didn't have a amplifier I'd make it if I had, didn't have a guitar I'd make it and um, eventually if I went to a music store and I played guitar, everybody would run. But if I opened a case of something I made, they would draw a crowd, and I had to start paying attention to that. Uh, it's not, ex it's not explainable. It's just true. Uh, haven't you ever had a, a hunch that you knew something, and you, but you uh, didn't know why you knew it? Yeah. There it That's is. That's it. It's fantastic. Okay. When did you build the first one? Well, if you consider putting a guitar together from having a neck already, it was a bass that I made in high school. If you consider it that you had to make the neck, which is, I think, guitar making, it was in college for an independent study project in the art school. Build it in the basement of the, um, the art building. Um, <laughs> there would be a jewelry class going on right next, you know, right next to me while I was sitting there with a, actually, I sort of made the first one with a pocket knife. It was uh, that rough. And it was a single cutaway, single pickup guitar. I thought it was a good place to start the art. So the second one was a double cutaway to do different neck joints. Now, I actually had an idea of how to move along in baby steps. You gotta do first thing first, second thing second, you know. Uh, what did the jewelry class think about this guy building a, a rock and roll guitar in the next room? Um, I think everybody was interested and they scratched their head a little bit. You know, like that. <laughs> And the art teacher helped me a lot. I mean, you know, uh, his name was Earl Hoffman, and he spent a lot of time with me, um, just trying to uh, guide me in the right direction, you know, help me where he could, lend me tools, um, give me some of his time, talk to me when I was lonely, that sort of thing. Tell us a little bit about how you sold the first one. I'm pretty sure it was Jimmy Thackeray of the Nighthawks. And I gave him the guitar to try, and he ended up buying it. It was one of your first sales to, to Frampton, major sales? Yeah, I built a guitar for Ted Nugent and I showed Peter Frampton the guitar before I took it to 10 at the Capitol Center. And he said he'd like me to make him a guitar and we talked about specifically sort of what it would be like and he said he'd call me. Well, he never called me, but I made the guitar anyway and he showed up at uh, American University and I showed it to him. I said, this is what you, you know, what we talked about making. And he fell in love with it and gave me some money and it was downhill from there. Um, Did he help him? That's when Peter's career was taken off, just, just mm -hmm. as it was blasting off. Did that help introduce you to other big name stars? Yeah, because what I did was I took that guitar and I went around and showed all the other bands that came to town right before I gave the guitar to Peter. It was about a week where I had the guitar finished and um, I hadn't given it to him yet because he was out on the road. So I went and showed Little Feet and Alton Miola and all these bands came to town right at that period of time where in that week, it's week span, was, it was really ironic that so many good bands would be in town at that time. I think Ted Nugent was in town, uh, Aerosmith was in town, uh, Leonard Skinner was in town. I mean, so many bands in that one week span and I just went and showed everybody. And so I. I capitalized on the fact that he hadn't gotten his guitar yet and I showed a thing to everyone. Well, Ted Nugent was playing at the Capitol Center and I showed up about 12 noon and um, I had guitars under my arms and I actually pulled a real stunt. I ran into the room and said, I'm late, where's the stage? And the guys went, that way! <laughs> I swear that happened. And they just went right and on in and the stage. I went and I talked to the... Um, I went and talked to the roadies and showed them the guitars, and they said, eh, we'll just introduce you to Ted. Ted's always interested in stuff, and it went from there. One time, which was good fun, this guy hated me. I mean, he didn't hate me, but 
he didn't like me very much because I was always coming to the shows, you know, and he didn't want me there. And I get thrown out, basically. And Ted Nugent is coming down the big walkway at the Capitol Center, and he says, come on, Paul, come with me. And he walks in, and he looks at this big guy, Dave Williams, and he goes, give him a pass. And David went, you want him to have a pass? Ted goes, yeah. Ted's a big guy. Ted's tall, right? The guy takes the pass out. He peels it up. He puts it on him, and he goes, boom, and hits me in the chest to glue it on I acted like nothing happened, but he hit me pretty hard. So uh, one time there was a guy, the same guy was right on my tail at uh, Cole Fieldhouse, which is the big venue at Maryland University. And just as he went to grab me, I showed the guitar to Brian, um, Brian and Queen. And, uh, and Brian was very interested and he backed off. So that's very interesting. Brian May. What was it about the guitars you were used to playing that you felt wasn't there in the ultimate guitar? At the time, absolutely nothing. I didn't feel like there was anything lost in the whole Fender school or in the whole Gibson school at the time. I, I was really enjoying the old West Pauls that, that were around and I was just hoping at the time to be able to come, get somewhere near them. I never thought that we'd actually make improvements. I mean, literally, you would see people on stage and they would have a humbucking guitar and a single cool guitar, and they would almost want to pick one of the guitars up for the rhythm part, one of the guitars up for the, for the lead part. Um, that was, you know, kind of the way it was. If you listen to LaGrange, there's a humbucking guitar on one solo and there's a single cool solo on the other solo, you know. It's not atypical. I mean, it's the way it was, and I thought it would be good to have something that did both jobs. Um, so the scale length was in the middle, the body shapes were in the middle, the tremolo systems were kind of in the middle, the bridges were kind of in the middle, pickups, pickup systems, the, ro the rotary switch made other wirings possible, um, the way the necks felt were in the middle. There was a lot in the middle that was very acceptable territory that hadn't been treaded yet, hadn't been walked on. So to me that was an opportunity. Earlier you told me you considered three main factors in designing and building your instruments. Its looks, its feel in the player's hands, mm -hmm. and the sound that it produces. Mm -hmm. How about starting with these concepts and show us how your guitar fulfills these requirements. Let's, let's go with the looks first. What's important about the looks of the instrument? Well, I tried to come up with a very classic, classic design, something that had uh, contours that were something that someone would immediately feel comfortable with. It's uh, very symmetrical from here back. Um, somewhere in between an old Les Paul and a Stratocaster. And then from here up, I've tried to come up with something that's, um, it balances well when you set it on your leg. When you hang it from a strap, it balances well. Yet yeah, it looks, a strap player would pick it up and say, oh, this thing looks fine. And a Les Paul player would pick it up and say, this thing looks fine. So I sort of tried to go right down the middle, something that both kind of players would feel comfortable with. There are Stratocaster players and Fender players, and then you have your Gibson players, and they're usually in two separate, two separate areas and most recently people have been buying a Les Paul and then they buy a Strat and they sort of switch guitars and tunes and the idea of this is you wouldn't have to do that. So um, when we're doing new models we're very attentive to how it looks, um, very attentive to how it sounds and very attentive to what it feels like. So there's a new model that we're getting ready to release and um, that instrument went through maybe four or five iterations of how it looked and the sound of it uh, has something to do with the way it looks because the pickups have different shapes in the instrument. Um, and there's a pick guard to it which is how it's built and not how it plays but it helps how it sounds because of the way the pickups are mounted but it, it has to do with how it looks and it's all kind of integrated as to one thing. And if we're not happy with one of those areas we do something about it before we release it and we find any problems with that we try to do something about it as quickly as we can there are instruments that have been here for since the beginning that we're still making little modifications to if we think it will look better sound better or feel better now you have a factory for prs guitars in the works what's the story on that well it's a 5500 square foot <laughs> 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 you print that i'm kidding <laughs>
It's a 5,500 square foot factory over in the industrial park behind Old Magruder's on West Street. Um, we've completely built it just for making guitars. It's air conditioned and heated and humidity controlled, both um, dehumidified for the summer and humidified for the winter. So you keep a relative humidity of 40% in the building all year long. That way your necks don't warp and do funny things. If you take a piece of mahogany and you run it from 30% relative humidity to 50, it'll bend on you. It really, uh, humidity has a huge effect on wood. So we have to actually be atmosphere controlled in the building. And that's all done. It's all insulated. Um, we've got some of the machinery in there. We're getting ready to purchase the rest of the machinery. It's um, been painted. It's actually very beautiful. So in terms of the size of the factory, uh, Virginia Avenue was pretty small, and then we doubled it, and then we tripled it, and then we moved here into a 25,000 square foot factory, and now we're north of 100,000 square feet, including the wood building and the two buildings here that are all tied together, and the two floors and all the offices. And it's a lot of space here. Um, we're starting to fill it up, though. I went out on a 10-day tour and actually took um, about three hundred thousand dollars worth of orders, just like that, which is something that other companies would spend months trying to do. Was, they've heard of me. They want the instruments already. They get them in their hands and they go, oh, well, "Okay, we'll take as many as we can get." Um, so there's a real um, market for them at this point. Fender's been sold. Gibson's not doing very well, and so there's the market's actually wide open anyway. And people have heard of the things for years and would like to buy them. So you're going to get into more prolific production. In the beginning, like 200 guitars a month, right? A few years in. A few years ago, maybe three years ago, we were making 1,000 guitars a month. And then when we did the S2 line, we backed down, that backed down to about 700 guitars a month, and S2s were at 600. So now we're making 13, 1,400 guitars a month, but less of the core guitars that we make that cost somebody in the store maybe, you know, 3200 bucks and more of the guitars that came in at somewhere around $1,300. So we're making more guitars, but less of the core instruments that we were making a few years ago. And then there's another 1800 a month of the SE guitars that are made. Not here, but we open every one and check them and look after them. Um, there's about 250 people that work here now. It's a lot of people. In a, in a factory, you have jigs and fixtures, things that when you put a neck blank in and you do the operation, it cuts it exactly right. And I used to sit there with a pencil and have to draw the operation on every time, and it left a lot of room for human error. And now we're going to try to eliminate the, the, um, the, the large area of human error in building these things. Actually, when I there'll be a machine that'll come back around and cut this neck exactly the shape instead of me having to draw it with a pencil and go around and cut it with a bandsaw and then reroute it and na 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 you know. So all your rough work will be taken care of by machines and the rest be taken care of still by hand? Mm, um, sp specifically I would have to say no. A lot of the stuff will be taken care of with the machines. The top is carved with a machine already. We have a machine that did carve this top. Um, the uh, plans I was showing you we're for rounding the fingerboard. It's a sanding machine. I, I used to do this by hand. This will be done with a machine now. Um, the carve in the back of the neck, I used to do by hand. I'll have a machine that carves the back of the neck. I used to uh, cut out all the birds by hand. I have a company that's going to ship them in for me. Um, I used to wind the pickups with a Dremel Mototone on a Variac. I'm going to have a pickup coil winding machine. Um, uh, we used to make the bridges one at a time. We're actually setting up, setting up production to make the bridges by the thousands. So um, most of the hand steps, quote unquote, hand steps with a chisel and a hammer, that sort of thing, will be eliminated. Um, it, all the steps were done by hand. I mean, if it was the Martin factory, they would say, this is a handmade guitar. I'm not going to go that far and call it a handmade guitar anymore. But I think it will be the same quality. Actually, I'm actually aiming to improve the quality. The question I just got asked was, am I where I wanted to be 30 years ago? Yes and no. I, I never thought 
the learning curve would be so intense and so long. I never thought the learning curve would be so enjoyable. Probably the most enjoyable thing to do is to huff down to Mark Quigley's office or somebody's office here and say, look at this new thing we just figured out, right? It's fun. I enjoyed doing that. Um, I never thought that the music business would be where it's at right now, which is an interesting place. If Right now, if you have a TV set and it breaks, you throw it away. 20 years ago, you had a TV set and you went to the repair shop and fixed it. And this place is making heirloom level instruments and you know, it, we, we're attached to that old way of care and f having a beautiful care and feeding for your musical instrument, you know. I don't want them thrown away. I want them kept in families for a really long time. Um, I didn't think my hair would turn white. I didn't think I would grow a yarmulke on the back of my head, although my grandfather was bald. Uh, I never thought that I would be in the band of men which is a joy. I never thought so many people would be here so long. I never thought that some of the issues would have been so painful. I didn't know some of the issues would be so joyful. I didn't know the trade show things would change as much as they did. I didn't know the internet was gonna show up. I mean, I'll give you one example. Had we known the internet was gonna be so powerful, we would have applied for PRS.com. But Performing Rights Society got that before us, so we're PRSGuitars.com. You know, I had no idea so many people would imitate what we've done. It just, uh, there's so many things that I didn't think of and so many things that I wished would happen that have and wished would happen that didn't and things I would have prayed wouldn't happen that did. You know, I prayed would have happened that didn't. It's complicated. You're asking a complicated question. Um, I've studied a lot of guitar makers, you know, Stradivari, Guadagnini, Guanari, uh, D'Angelico, Ted McCarty, Leo Fender, uh, Christian Martin, all these guitar makers in our past, right? And none of them got good, not really good, till they're about 50. So 55, I think guitar making is more like 50,000 hours to get good. There's been a study where they say it takes 10,000 hours to get good at something. It might take 50. And so at my age, it's expected that the guitar makers aren't exper ex experimenting so much and they have gotten to a formula that they can count on over and over and over again. And I think that that is beginning to happen here. That I'm proud of. I mean, if we put these tuning pegs and this finish and these nuts and, and all the things we figured out about where and how to put the frets in and put these pickups in and this bridge and this, this, and this, and this, I can almost guarantee you in blood and bone that you got a good sounding instrument. That we didn't know. In 85, we were listening to everyone, you know, learning, 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 learning. But I think the formula's gotten way more reliable as time goes on. So I didn't know about that either. I didn't know it was gonna be such a long learning curve. I had no idea. Thank you.